It's out of the way, probably. There we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, first, a little public address announcement. This class is in honor of a great guy, Dan Hardy. Hi, Dan. Uh, Dan Hardy. Dan Hardy. Woo! Okay. Getting back into Patek Dalid. I don't remember where we left off last time. So... Uh, this Patek is speaking about the garments of the soul. The chapter before, he was speaking about the actual soul. The truth is, it's not the actual soul, but it is the 10 powers of the soul that are closely connected to the soul to the degree that they are referred to as the powers of the soul or comprising the soul, even though they're just the powers of the soul. In this chapter, he's speaking about the levushim, the garments of the soul, the expressions of the soul. The source of the expressions of the soul are, of course, the gar are is of course the powers of the soul, the intellectual powers and the emotional powers. What are the expressions? Thought, speech, and action. In other words, when the, when the emotional and intellectual powers of the soul, which is all of the godly soul, which is all directed to godliness, wants to express its emotion and its intellect, its knowledge and feelings towards God, how does it do it? Through the three garments, three vehicles, Three modes of expression, thought, speech, and action. In thought, one is expressing his, so to speak, his knowledge and feelings for himself. And in speech and action, it's already outside of himself. And he said that when a person ex is expressing his intellect and his emotions in Torah and mitzvahs, he is clothing his intellect and emotions in Torah and mitzvahs, then literally his entire being is invested and clothed in godliness of Torah and mitzvahs. And now he's going in de into detail which part of the, of the godly powers are invested and how are they invested in the different levushim in the different garments? And he starts with the word ubeprotus, meaning and in detail, what is invested in what? So he says, Pchinas chochme binavadasha benafshay, the levels, the intellectual levels of chochme binandas, which is in his nefeshali kiss, mlubashay's. They become clothed, meaning they are now immersed. They are thinking about, they are involved with what? Hasogas ha comprehension of Torah. Now, Torah itself has four different levels of comprehension, Shehu Masik, that he understands in these four levels, which are referred to as Pshat, Remes, Drush, and Sod. The literal allegory, uh, the literal translation, an illusion, uh, allegorical, esoteric. So whether he's involved in any of these four levels of the Torah, his intellectual, the intellectual aspects of his soul is immersed in them. To what degree is he immersed in them? That's going to depend on two things: his capability his physical capability of understanding. Each person is different. There's no equality in mankind in that sense. There's equality in what is requested and required of us. The fact is people have different chushim, different abilities. Some people have a better head. Some people have a lot worse head. We were not recreated all equal in that sense. And so the smarter person is, he's going to be able to understand on a deeper level. That is one thing that's going to make a difference in how much he understands in the Torah and Mitzvahs, his ability, his intellectual ability. And also another difference will depend on Shodesh Nafshei Lemailo, the source of his soul above 
as we learned before, the soul has many, it all comes from one essential point, but then in its descent down to this world, this descent affects different souls on a completely different level. Some souls remained remain on the level of Atsilis, this higher level of attachment to godliness, and therefore their comprehension and ability to perceive godliness is going to be a lot greater. And those that come from a lower level of ultimate in this uh, uh, world of Hishtalshlos, whether they come from the world of Bria or Yitzira or Asiya, that is also going to affect their capacity to understand Torah and Mitzvahs, which is their capacity for godliness. Now, we said before that the level of person's head is going to determine how much he understands. In learning, always in the yeshiva, they used to say there are two components in learning. You have to have a good head and you have to have a good behind. What does it mean to have a good behind? To simply sit and work and develop a head. Even though a head is not literally a muscle, but it could be developed by constantly using it and working on it. Somebody who has initially a poor head is literally able to elevate the quality of his head and is able to learn ultimately something on a much higher level than he was, so to speak, predestined to be able to comprehend because he worked on himself and he elevated it. But in general, these two things are going to limit his understanding of God, the level of his head, and also the level of his soul. Okay, let's continue down the page a little. Oh, does this work? Okay. Okay, so this is how we find that the intellectual properties of the soul, the intellectual qualities are invested in what he is doing. What about the emotional properties? Because when we're speaking about action, it's, it's already, it's not an emotion. So he says, Vahamidais, and the emotional attributes, Shehen Yiravi Ava, which primarily is fear of God or awe of God, the Avan, love of God, van Feim, and their offshoots, for told they say him, and also the different ramifications, literally their offspring, because all of the other midos are all a type of offspring of love and fear. So they are mlubashais, they are enclothed, meaning they are manifested where the kiyum ha mitzvahs in the fulfillment of the mitzvahs, the maisu bedibor in action and in speech, shahu, which action and speech? Shehu Talmud Torah Shekineget Kula, in action and in speech, specifically speech, learning Torah, which is really considered equal to all of the Torah and mitzvahs. How is this in detail? So he says, Ki ha'ava love. If somebody loves Hashem, the idea of love, he's not speaking over here about a selfish love that I love a person because it makes me feel good about myself that I'm seen with this person, or it makes me feel good that this person is my wife or my girlfriend. He's speaking about genuinely caring very, very strongly about someone to the degree that you want to do whatever this person finds enjoyable. You want to please them. You want to see their happiness. So such a love, he ha'ava, of the love, such a type of love that you really care about the person, he shoyrish, it is the root, it is the source of kol ramach mitzvah sasei, the observance of all 248 positive commandments. So first of all, it's the source of it. I'm going to do the mitzvah because I love Hashem and I want to make him happy. And they're derived from there. Not only that it starts from there, but the entire observance of the mitzvah, the continuation of doing it is constantly because I'm trying to bring pleasure to this 
being that I love to Hashem. Ubil Otto, and without this love, Ain Lohen Kiyum Amiti. They will not have true fulfillment and true substance, as he says here. I can do it, but if I'm not doing it with true love, I'm doing it in a half-hearted way. I do it when it's easy for me, when it's hard. I'm not going to do it. Any excuse I have, I'm not going to do it. But if I'm doing it, I have a genuine, genuine love for the being that gave these commandments and wants me to do it. And he said, this is what brings me happiness. If I love the person, I want to bring them happiness. And if the mitzvah brings him happiness, then I want to do it. Now, the fact is, all of the mitzvahs are also designed to bring happiness to the person doing it. Because all of the, but those are what we call, it's a fringe benefit. We do the mitzvah because God wants us to do it. We do the mitzvah, this is how we connect to Hashem, as he says later. And he'll go into that in depth soon. So the way to connect to Hashem, the only real way to connect to Hashem is through doing mitzvahs. And I love Hashem, I want to connect, so I do the mitzvah. The fact, however, is that any mitzvah that Hashem gave us is going to have side effects that are good for the human being physically also. How? We don't know exactly on everything. We don't know how putting on tefillin is something positive for us. We do know kosher is something positive for the person. Many of the mitzvahs do have a physical connection and a benefit for the person. We don't know all of them. But the fact is, my primary interest in doing it, if it's just for Hashem, out of my love for Hashem, then no matter what, I will do it. And as he continues now, Ki HaMekaimon BeEmes, who really fulfills the mitzvah in truth, meaning completely, honestly, and totally, Hashem. He loves the name of Hashem, meaning he loves the being of Hashem. And he truly wants to be connected to Hashem. Now, the question comes up, wait a second. If I love a person, it's a feeling in my heart. And I feel I am connected to the person by loving them. True. This love is going to find expression in what I do for them, in holding them, in being kind to them, in doing anything that will bring them enjoyment and pleasure and happiness. But all of this stems from my feeling. Why over here is he saying that the feeling of love is going to bring me to doing all of those mitzvahs, those actions, which I would think is not really a true expression of my love. It's an external expression. And I would think that a deeper manifestation and expression of my love is the passion that I feel in my heart. It drives me to God. I'm ready to die for God. Who cares if I do this little mitzvah, if I go and wrap some strap around my hand? That's supposed to be showing love for God. How is that? My feeling is overwhelming. Isn't that the most important thing? This is what the Alter Rebbe is coming now to, an to answer. This very question. And he's going to say, and he starts up by saying, You are not able to truly cling and connect to God only through the observance of the 248 commandments. I can connect to another thing, another object, another person, another pet, or anything, if that is also a physical human being like myself. So my physicality is expressing love for something else that is on my level, at least to a degree, it's a physical existence that I realize, that I see, that I understand. For me to be connected to God, something which is completely 
beyond me, completely beyond my understanding. It is a concept. In other words, God is a reality. But in my reality, it is only a concept because I have no way of understanding and connecting to the real being of God because I'm a creation, I'm a very, very limited, finite being, and God is infinite, and there's no way, never shall the, never shall the twain meet. No way can we get together except through the fulfillment of the mitzvahs. How is that? And he's going to explain. The mitzvahs are not just something that God told us to do. Something, some capricious idea that God is telling us to do, and it has nothing to do with God himself. On the contrary, as he explained in the second chapter of Tanya, God's being is not like our being. His whole being is not the same type of the being that we are familiar with in a human being. In a human being, there are three entities. There is the, the person. There's the person who knows something with his brain. So there's the person. There's the brain that acquires the knowledge. And then there's the object of his knowledge. So there are three different components, the person, the brain, and the knowledge. God, who is indivisible, not compartmentalized in any way, is also going to have these three entities of his entity and, so to speak, his brain and what he knows. But in God, it is somehow one entity, indivisible. Can we understand that? No, the Rambam said right away, and this was quoted in chapter two. We cannot understand that because it's not within our frame of reference in any way. We can't conceive of something like that. We can know about it. We cannot conceive it, however. So when God says, this is something that I want, a mitzvah is my rotzain, what I want, Torah is my chachma, is my knowledge. And as we just said, by Hashem, his knowledge and his wanting, his will, is one essence with he himself. So by my fulfilling the mitzvah of Hashem, by my learning the knowledge of Hashem, the Torah, literally, my soul is now becoming one through my, through my intellectual components, through, I, through my emotional components, as they are finding expression in the fulfillment and speaking words of Torah, thinking words of Torah, and fulfilling physical commandments, my soul components are literally becoming connected with godliness. On my own, I cannot become connected with godliness. And I need to become connected through godliness on God's terms. I cannot do it on my terms. My terms are not able to connect to God. I can connect to God on God's terms. And God's terms are the Torah and mitzvahs because those are not just God's terms. Those are, in essence, part of God. It is one essence with God. And therefore, that's what he's saying here. The EF shed, again, the line, the EF shed, and there's no way of connecting truly to God. He in Bikim Ramach Pekudin, only through the fulfillment of the 248, Pekudin means positive commandments in the Torah. How is this connecting to God? So he says, and this is brought down in Kabbalah, every mitzvah is an expression of a certain power of God, of a certain part to speak, so to speak, of God. Just like a human being has 248 limbs and 365 like sinews or other parts, the same way in a spiritual sense, God or godliness is comprised of these 613 components. 
each one of these components finds expression in one of the 613 commandments. So literally connecting to God is through connecting to these 613 components of God, which makes up the 613 commandments. So by, con by fulfilling the 613 commandments, I am literally, and it is the only way of truly connecting to God on his level, which is the only level I could. And now he explains it. So he says, Ahava, he said before, Ava, the love is going to bring me to fulfill all of the positive commandments. What about the fear of awe at the level of awe and the level of fear? Where does that come into play? Is fear also a motivator of my doing Torah and mitzvahs to connect me to God? So he says, yes. The hayira and the fear or awe of God, he shayrish, it is the source. Now it's interesting. Before he used the term by love, he didn't just say it's the source. He said it is also nimshaches. It derives from there and it continues from there. Over here, he doesn't say that. He just said it's the source. Why would that be? I was thinking very simply. To do an action, there's two parts. I am motivated to do the action, and then there's the extended period of my doing the action. In my refraining from doing a sin, there is my refraining. Can I say the whole time I am still refraining and still refraining and still refraining since there's no real action? This is all the continuation of my initial refraining. Although it does say if somebody sits and refrains from a sin, he gets somehow a reward for the whole time. But it's not really applicable to say it's an action of refraining. Once I refrain, it is only one time. And there's a cute little story that happened once with the Rebbe. Somebody who was close with the Rebbe, and uh, he came into the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said to him, which is unusual, the Rebbe says, Vos tutzach, what's doing? In other words, usually when a chaser went into the Rebbe, they would go in, give the Rebbe a note, the Rebbe would respond, then maybe the Rebbe would ask specific questions in the different details. But just to say what's happening, that was unusual. So this person was somehow, you know, he's not going to just start talking. So he quoted a Talmudic saying, which is, Mila Bisela Ushte Kuso Betre. A word is worth a dollar, silence is worth two dollars. So in other words, he was saying to the Rebbe somehow, you ask me to say something, so a word saying something is only a dollar, and silence is two dollars, so I will keep quiet. It's worth more than my saying something. It was a very respectful way. So the Rebbe said to them, it's true. A word is worth one dollar and silence is worth two dollars. The problem with that is silence can be only once. So you're limited to one time silence. So all you can get is two dollars. Word, you can keep on talking and each word is something. But in any case over here also in a sense, once you don't do it, it's still the same not doing it. So he says, the hayira and the fear are of God. He shayrish, it is the source, it is the root. The shasa of the 365 negative commandments. Don't do this. Why? So he says, ki yare, he is afraid, or he, he is in awe. Limre to rebel, b'melech malche amloch makarish baruchu, the king of kings, Hashem, God Almighty. That's a lower level. He's afraid to go against God. A year, <coughs> excuse me, a year of pnimis mazai, a deeper level of awe than being afraid to go against the king. And he's not speaking afraid of punishment, but afraid of to do something. The king said, How can I go against him? 
there's a deeper level, Shem is Baishesh Migdulosai. He is so humbled, he's so embarrassed, so to speak, of the greatness of God in relationship to him, that the idea of doing something against his greatness of godliness is not something that, oh, I'm going against him, I can't do it. It's an automatic thing that God is so great and I'm nothing, he's not even capable of contemplating of going against them. Lamres rebel, enek fede, against the all-seeing or the omnipotent, omniscient God, philosophies haraba enov, and to do what God considers bad. What does, does God consider to be bad? Now, anything that's here in this world is created by God. So how can I say it's bad? So he's going to go on to explain what is considered bad and why are these things bad? Shall we continue? Uh, well, how long is it? I mean, it's Time. Oh, okay, we'll stop here. So we're up to Kol Tayavas Hashem Arsay Sunay, all of those things that are disgusting to God that he hates. Oh, okay. We'll continue next week. Okay. Any we'll questions now? Or do you want to cut it? Yeah, we should stop here. Okay. Ellie says no questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. We'll speak to you next week. <laughs>